Welcome. In this video, I will cover an introduction to the Bake Shop from Chapter 30 on your own cooking textbook. Up until this point, we have been talking about cooking terms in general. Well, welcome to the baking world. We are no longer talking about recipes, but now formulas, in which case everything needs to be exact. You'll find most things are going to be measured when we're talking about baking formulas and measured with the metric system. The grams is the smallest measurement that we have. So a lot of measurements, four grams, eight grams, you will have to learn how to measure using the metric system. Your most basic piece of equipment for measuring then would be your scale. On the right here, this is a picture of the baker's scale or a balance scale. This is where it has two different platforms here, and initially our balance. This is a counterweight to account for the weight of the bin here. You can then add, here's an eight pound weight or four pound weight, two or one. You can add the amount of pounds you need onto this platform, which would lower this. If you need less than a pound, these are 16 ounces here that you could add. So you get your weight here, and then you would fill this bin and wait for these two to balance out. That's how you would measure product. It's great for large amounts of, say, flour. Then, when extending recipes, you can look at it instead of coming up with a conversion factor by using a baker's percentage. What this does is it puts everything in ratios instead of actual amounts that you would adjust and come up with odd, odd numbers. So in taking that, the flour is always 100%. So if sugar is 200%, that means if you had eight ounces of flour, you would have a pound of sugar. If you had two different flours in the recipe, you would total them up to being 100%. So you might have 20% whole wheat flour and 80% all-purpose flour. Again, that total amount there, that let's say one pound, would be 100%. So if sugar was 50%, then you would be looking for half a pound of that. And then that way, no matter how you extend and adjust the recipe, the flour is always your starting point and you're always taking a percent of that ingredient amount then. I've included an additional video on specific measuring in the bake shop. Let's talk about ingredients. First up is flour. A lot of flour will come from grains, all flour actually, but a lot of flour will come from the wheat berry specifically. Pictured on the top right here is a wheat kernel coming right off of the whole stock here and you'll see that each kernel each berry will have an outer outside husk here within you'll find the bran and then you'll find the endosperm and then you'll have this little germ in here the germ is where you'll find all of the fat it's kind of like the egg yolk and then the endosperm then is where you'll find all the protein kind of like the egg white and then this bran on the outside can be related to the shell of the egg it's if you were to take that part and grind it up, think of a shell ground up in your dough. It's going to act like little plastic, little pieces of, of glass, little shards in there. And we'll get to that in a minute. So the bran is the outer layering. The endosperm then is the bulk of it. And then the germ is where most of the fat will be found. Flour provides the bulk and structure of your baked goods. It's also used as a thickener and used as a non-stick agent in coating pans. There are a variety of different flours. You have corn flour that would come from corn, rice flours, you know, oat flour, rye, potato flour, you know, you name it. Now there seems to be a flour made from any type of grain uh, that you can find out there. But the wheat flours are what we're talking about mainly in the kitchen. And there is whole wheat. But then if you were to take this outer bran layer off, now you have your white wheat flours, which would be cake flour, your pastry flour, all-purpose flour, and your bread flour. There's also other varieties of high gluten, bleached and unbleached. There's double O flour. These are all different varieties of flour that have a different amount of protein in it. And the two main proteins we talk about are gluten and gliadin here. These two proteins, when they absorb moisture, they start to form what's called gluten. And gluten is what you hear very often with the celiac disease that students, or just people in general, I should say, um, have an intolerance to. And this gluten forming substance, uh, gluten really isn't something. It is a substance that is formed from these proteins. Gluten is found in the wheat berry as well as the rye and barley. 
So it's important to know what flowers are actually coming and what products are coming from the wheat berry. When we talk about a strong flower versus a weak flower, a strong flower is one that has a lot of gluten potential in it, such as your bread flour. It has a lot of protein in it, so it, it has a lot of potential to build up a really strong network of, of structure. And I have another video following to talk a little bit more about gluten for you. A weak flour then would be like your cake flour. Think of how soft your cake is versus how hard and crusty, crunchy your French bread could be. So with a soft or weak flour, you end up having one that doesn't have as much protein and doesn't become as tough of a product. So that's important when you're looking at your varieties of flowers and what to use. Um, when I mentioned about that bran layer left on, acting again kind of like an eggshell with a bunch of little shards within your dough, imagine that now with gluten acting as, let's think of a bunch of rubber bands stretching. If you have a lot of those little shards, it's going to be breaking up those, those little gluten strands and ends up in a very dense product. And that's why gluten-free products are typically very, very dense. So if you're using a whole wheat flour, it's common to mix it with some other type of flour in order to develop enough gluten to have a good product. Sugars then. Sugar really acts as a leavener. It, it traps, and again with the creaming effect, it traps the air um, with the fat in the product. Definitely acts as a sweetener, but then it has a great moisture retaining quality. So having something that you know, has a lot of sugar in it, it'll be able to capture moisture from the air and stay nice and moist a lot longer. It also does weaken the gluten potential um, and then results in a more tender product. So sugar comes from two main sources. You have your sugar beets and your sugar cane. Um, and there are a couple specific sugars that we talk about. Glucose coming from honey, fructose coming from fruit, and then your sucrose coming from sugar. And again below I have your sugar beets and your sugar canes here to show you as an example. So as sugar goes through the refinement process, this is the most raw state that we have sugar in, which is called your turbinado sugar or your demerara sugar. It is processed, but is not refined. Once you refine this demerara sugar, which again can be found right in this picture, you end up getting your white granulated sugar and molasses as a byproduct. Down below, I have a light brown sugar and dark brown sugar. To make a light brown sugar, molasses is added back in, and even more molasses then for your dark brown sugar. There is then a super fine sugar. Here we can look at a comparison of granulated sugar, super fine sugar. I've used a lot of times in crystallizing pansies or very delicate um, confectionery work. And then you have even finer than your confectioner sugar. Your powdered sugar confectioner sugar is mixed with cornstarch due to the fact that it does get too, it's too powdery. You need something of substance in there. And then you see this 4x, 6x, and 10x. Imagine taking granulated sugar in a food processor, pulsing it four times. It would be powdery, but it wouldn't be as fine as if you pulsed it 10 times. 10x sugar is what we'll commonly find in our grocery stores. Your 4x and 6x is what you find on your powdered donuts. Have you ever wondered why, if you just sprinkled powdered sugar on something, why it just dissolves into it? The 4X or 6X not being as coarse, it'll remain on the outside of your products, such as your powdered donuts. There is also a sanding sugar that you'll find at the top here. This, it's more coarser, coarser crystals. Uh, it's called a sanding sugar uh, and comes in a variety of different colors as well. There are sweeteners that also classify in your sugar category here. And your liquid sweeteners are inverted sugars, which also will absorb a lot of moisture from the air. So you have your corn syrup, um, which could be substituted for a glucose, which is just a more, again, pure form of sugar. But your corn starch will come in a light variety, as well as your dark corn syrup. I have never actually seen in a grocery store this vanilla flavored um, corn starch that we'll find over here. You do have honey, that again is going to be coming from the beehives and production there. And down on the bottom right here is a picture of your maple syrup coming from your maple trees. And then molasses, which again was that byproduct of sugar refining, has a very distinct burnt flavor, caramelized flavor, and it adds to a lot of your products. That then, 
that actually greases up those rubber band strands that I was mentioning that I'm referring to as gluten. It then tenderizes it because those gluten strands can't get overworked. It, it can't be overstretched. So it actually keeps it to being a nice, very tender product. Flavorful, the moisture is in there, as well as its shelf life is usually extended with the more fat that it has in it. It does help with the leavening and trapping air when you are creaming again the sugar and the fat together. Butter definitely has a better flavor, um, is hard at, at cold temperatures, uh, but does melt when it gets to higher temperatures. It is more expensive typically as well than your margarine. Margarine is something that you wouldn't have to soften before you use. Um, coming right out of the refrigerator would be in soft form. And then you also have your lard, but that is an actual animal product versus your margarine um, is more of a vegetarian product. The lard does act more like shortening, but needs to be kept refrigerated. Your shortening, there's hydrogenated or your vegetable shortening, and then your all-purpose shortening. Your emulsified shortening or high-ratio shortening is a very specific shortening used for high-ratio recipes, where there's a high ratio of liquid and eggs um, to, your, to your sugar and to your dry goods. So we'll talk about that a little bit more when we're talking about cakes, but generally your vegetable shortening is what you're going to use. They are not interchangeable. And then you have your varieties of oils. Definitely canola oil, vegetable oil uh, are commonly going to be used, but sometimes you'll have some other nut oils that, that don't have a strong flavor incorporated into your, your baking goods. Salt. It definitely adds flavor just like in all cooking methods, but now we're going to be using a finer salt for almost all of our baking formulas. Kosher salt, while it was great for cooking and you could feel the granules, sea salt, which is a much purer product, um, table salt, that fine salt, is really what we're looking for to make sure that we're getting as accurate a measurement as possible. It does also strengthen the gluten. Thickeners then, there's a variety of different thickeners, cornstarch, uh, which we talked about with our roux uh, earlier in the semester. Arrowroot, which is coming from actual arrowroot plant. We have waxy maize here, which is a form of corn. We have tapioca. Tapioca, the instant or minute tapioca here, as well as tapioca starch or tapioca pearls. You do need to soak the pearls before using that. And then you have gelatin down below. Gelatin, regardless to whether you're using sheet or the granulated gelatin, can be substituted as long as you're weighing them for equal amounts. Here you can see in the form of like the jello jigglers, just to, to relate what this gelatin does. It creates the product, that liquid, to gel up. Think of like jello. There is the idea of kind of rehydrating it and then heating it up to dissolve, called blooming gelatin, before you use it. And then flavorings to end. We do have vanilla extract is by far the most common flavoring, but vanilla is actually from the orchid family. It's a vine. Uh, it actually comes in a pod. And you can see here, it's this long pod-like structure to where you would cut it open and then scrape these little tiny seeds with the back of your knife to remove them. You could then incorporate this right into your, your baking product. But then this you can use and steep back into some milk. You can add it to sugar to make vanilla sugar or even vodka to make your vanilla vodka. It is by no means trash there. When you're getting your extracts, pure extract is a lot more expensive in that there's 35% alcohol content. It is a pure product versus your imitation that would have a lot of extra ingredients in it. Your oils, your emulsions, your extracts, Basically, your oils are as pure as, as, as can be. Your emulsification, your emulsions, would have a little bit more of a filter in there. And then your extracts, again, typically would have um, a lot of filter in there versus the flavor. So your oils are what's going to be the strongest. And then this chapter does touch on chocolate. And there are so many different types of chocolate. But I did want to draw your attention to at least in the center here with these coins, which are tempered coverture chocolate coins. There are... Four main types, I should say, white chocolate, milk chocolate, dark chocolate, and then this is your raw chocolate or your bitter chocolate, which does not have any sugar in it and is 100% cocoa, which means that it is very, very bitter and strong tasting. I will continue in my next video more on the baking section. Thank you.